This video was brought to you by Control Laboratorium, University of Indonesia. This is the third part of our series of basic control system lectures. Remember that our measures of performance of control system are 1. Transient response and 2. Steady state error. But it will be useless of talking about those things if our system is unstable. So, let's talk about stability. The definition of a stable system is a system whose natural response approaches zero as time approaches infinity. Unstable systems, however, its response grows without bounds as time approaches infinity. While in marginally stable systems, the natural response neither decays nor grows. It oscillates. As time approaches infinity. To make things clear, let's draw a graph as a function of time. The response of a stable system will converge to a certain value. It does not necessarily converge to our desired output, it just needs to converge to a certain value. On the other hand, the response of an unstable system will just diverge, it just grows without bounds. Well then, what about marginally stable systems? Well, the response will neither converge nor diverge, it just oscillates around the desired output. We just talk about three types of stability of a system. But how do we determine whether a certain system is stable or not? To answer that question, it is necessary to understand what transfer function is first. Transfer function is simply a representation of a system using frequency domain function that maps an input to an output. Note that we are talking about frequency domain function, not a time domain function. You may already know two types of transformation that can transform time domain function into frequency domain. We have learned them in signal and systems class. They are Laplace transform and the Fourier transform. We are using the Laplace transform here, where the frequency is represented by complex numbers. Why Laplace transform? Well, I will leave it to you as an exercise. Here is the general form of a transfer function. We should notice that it consists of two parts, C of S and R of S, where C of S is the output of the system and R of S is the input of the system. If we want to know the output of our system given a certain input by simple algebraic manipulation, it is obvious that to get C of S, we only need to multiply our system, G of S, with our input, R of S. Let's revisit our block diagram. From now, it is obvious that inward pointing arrow to a block diagram means a multiplicative operator. It seems abstract for now, but hang on, let's use an example. Say we have an RLC circuit as our system. Our input is VI or V input. Say maybe it's a battery that you can regulate the voltage. And we are interested in observing the voltage across the capacitor or V of VC. What is the transfer function of this particular system? Well, let's construct the transfer function of our system using Kirchhoff's voltage law. It is obvious that VI equals to VR plus VL plus VC. By some algebraic manipulation and our knowledge about basic electric circuit, we can get this equation. Note that this function is still a time domain function, while transfer function is a frequency domain function or a Laplace frequency domain function, to be exact. So, do a Laplace transform, and we'll get this equation. We are almost done. Earlier, we know that our function can only consist of C of S or R of S term, so it can nicely be separated. It cannot contain any other variable. In this case, R of S is VI and C of S is VC it still has this I of S variable. We need to change it to either R of S or C of S.
We can do this by using our knowledge of V C of S equals to 1 over C S times I of S. Finally, substitute it all and we are done. Here's our transfer function of the system given T of S. That was the transfer function. Now let's talk about block diagram reduction. Usually, there are two configurations of block diagram, cascaded block diagram and feedback block diagram. It's very simple. It's just multiplication. For feedback block diagrams, let's derive it to give you a sense of how to manipulate the block diagram. From this part, we get that C of S is equal to E of S times G of S. Well, from this part, we get that E of S equals to R of S plus minus C S times G2 of S. This part here is called the summing junction. You might want to pause and ponder for a second. Look back into our equation and the block diagram carefully. From here, just substitute the second equation into the first equation. Then separate C of S and R of S to get this simplified version. So the simplified version of our feedback block diagram is G1 of S over 1 minus plus G1 of S times G2 of S. Let's use an example. There are two parts in this block diagram, the cascaded part and then the feedback part. Let's simplify the cascaded part first. It's simply multiplication, so it becomes S plus 3 times S plus 2. Next, let's simplify the feedback part. Using our previous formula, obviously we get S plus 3 times S plus 2 over 1 plus S. Plus 3 times S plus 2 times S plus 1. Note that the feedback is negative, so we use 1 plus. That's it. That was block diagram reduction. It is easy to get lost about what we are going to do. Let me remind you that we are here interested in analyzing the stability of a system. Before analyzing the system, I said that we should know about transfer functions first. Hence, we talk about transfer function and block diagram reduction. One last thing to know before analyzing the stability of the systems are poles and zeros. As you might have known from the signal and systems class, zeros are simply the roots of the numerator of our transfer function, while poles are simply the roots of the denominator. The denominator part of our transfer function is usually called the characteristic equation. As an example, say we are given a function s squared plus 4s plus 4 over s cubed plus 2s squared plus 2s. To get the zeros of the system, we factor out the numerator and we got minus 2 as its roots. To get the poles of the system, we factor out the denominator and we get 0, minus 1 plus minus imaginary as its 0. It is convenient to draw our zeros and poles in the s-plane. We denote our zeros as circles and poles as crosses. Finally, let's start analyzing our system. There are so many methods out there on analyzing the stability of a system. There's characteristic equation. There's the Ruth Howitz criterion. There's the continued fraction criterion. There's the Lyapunov criterion. And etc. etc. We will only discuss the characteristic equation method and the Ruth Howitz criterion. First up is the characteristic equation method, the simplest one. This method only requires you to locate the system's poles. A system is said to be stable if all of the system's poles are located in the left half of our S plane, or LHP for short. If there is only one pole on the right half plane, the system immediately goes unstable. It's good to use an example again. From the previous explanation, we will get this transfer function after simplifying the block diagram. Factoring out the equation, we get the following zeros and poles. Then we draw the poles and zeros in the S-plane. 
Earlier, I said that a system is said to be stable if and only if all the poles are located on the left half plane. So our system is stable if one pole sits in the right half plane, the system suddenly becomes unstable. But what about the poles that exactly sit on the imaginary axis? Well, from the earlier section, I mentioned that there are three types of stability. There are stable, unstable, and marginally stable. Marginally stable system's poles are all located on the imaginary axis. That's it for the first method. Next method is called the Ruth Hurwitz criterion. The Ruth Hurwitz method can tell how many systems poles are located in the right half plane, left half plane, and the imaginary axis. Notice that I said how many, not where. Ruth Hurwitz criterion will only tell about the number of poles in each section of the S plane, but not the exact location of where. While the characteristic equation method will tell you the exact location. Knowing the number of poles in the right half plane is enough to tell us about the system's stability. In this video, we're not going to discuss on how to count the number of poles that sit on the imaginary axis, but we will only count the number of poles that sit on the left half plane and right half plane. If you're curious about it, you can always take a reference from the book. Well, this method may raise questions like, if determining system stability is just about locating the system's poles, then why do we need other methods? Using characteristic equation will be enough. Well, try to locate the poles of this following system. In short, it's hard. It's hard to locate the poles of a higher order system. You might argue that we can use software to compute the poles like using MATLAB. So no need to use the Ruth Hurwitz criterion. But trust me, for the sake of passing control engineering class, just follow along. Even NASA can land a man on the moon without MATLAB, dude. Here's the first step. First is to find the simplified transfer function. Then construct the Ruth table out of the simplified transfer function. We only use the characteristic equation. From the Ruth table, you can count the number of changes of sign in the first column. That number is the number of poles in the right half plane. In other words, our system is said to be stable if there are no changes of sign in the first column of our Ruth table. Let's use an example. First step is obviously the simplification. Then we check for stability using the Ruth table. We will begin by drawing the table itself. Let's start by labeling the rows with the powers of s from the highest power of the denominator of the closed loop transfer function until s to the power of 0. Next, we will write the coefficients of the highest power of s in the denominator and list it in a zigzag fashion. In the first row, we will write the coefficient of s to the power of 3 and next to it is the coefficient of s to the power of 1. While in the second row, we will write the coefficient of s to the power of 2, and beside it is the coefficient of s to the power of 0. The remaining entries are filled in as follows. Each entry is a negative determinant of entries in the previous two rows, divided by the entry in the first column directly above the calculated row. The left-hand column of the determinant is always the first column of the previous two rows, and the right-hand column is the elements of the column above and to the right. The table is complete when all of the rows are completed down to s to the power of 0. Now, let's check for the signs in the first column. As we can see, there are no changes of sign. So, there are no poles on the RHP or we can say that our system is perfectly stable. It's valid since the result is the same with the characteristic equation method. That's it for the third part. We will see you next time.